आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा पद्म भूषण प्रोफेसर बी रामामूर्ति इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट एमिनेंट न्यूरो सर्जन्स ऑफ आवर टाइम एंड द फर्स्ट न्यूरो सर्जन इन इंडिया टू स्टार्ट अ न्यूरो सर्जिकल यूनिट इन अ स्टेट हॉस्पिटल इन 1950 ही एस्टैब्लिश्ड द फर्स्ट हेड इंजरी यूनिट इन इंडिया and founded the Institute of Neurology in Madras in 1970 Dr Ramamurthy founded the Dr Achanta Lakshmipati Neurological Center in Madras in 1978 at the Voluntary Health Services where he is head of the Department of Neurosurgery He is the honorary president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies At 74 the years sit lightly on this distinguished person He still maintains a tight schedule with remarkable agility and one of his favorite quotes is to reach the unreachable star it is my quest to follow the star no matter how hopeless no matter how far we will now gently unravel the story of professor ramamurthy finding out about the star he gazed on and the path he took to follow the star though it seemed so very far thank you mrs sabita radha krishnan i always start with an invocation to the lord vinayaka shrikanto matulo vayasya janani sarva mangala janaka shankaro devaha tam vande kunjarananam with the prayer to the almighty i would start the recording by narrating an interesting episode which you will like this was somewhere in 1960 i think this clerk who was working in the electricity board was a very docile person a happy family man gradually he became irritable began to fight with his wife and children which may not be unusual but unusual in him then he began to irritate his juniors and fight with his seniors and one day it came to a pass that he went to the chief's office and being asked a question hit him and called him a fool this was too much he was charge sheeted and suspended and was referred to a psychiatrist then he was transferred to the mental hospital in kill park all of you know about kill park mental hospital luckily for him a new superintendent had taken over this was dr sharada menon a very eminent psychiatrist and she believed that mental diseases could very well be caused by brain diseases that is not something in the air but actually a change in the brain could alter the mental function so she examined this patient and found that this chap had increased pressure inside the head that surprised her immediately she sent the patient to me to the general hospital where i was the neurosurgeon on examining i found that he had definite evidence of pressure on the brain we did some tests and we found that he had a large tumor in the front portion of the head it is the front portion of the brain frontal lobe which makes us capable of judgment control and all the higher levels of function that this man had lost luckily it was a removable tumor i operated on him and removed the tumor completely within about 6 weeks he became his normal self and when reminded about his this episode of insubordination he was more surprised than anybody else you mean he didn't remember anything no he didn't remember his subordination he remembered who he was and all that but he could not imagine how he can go and hit his boss but that is not his fault it is the fault of the tumor and at this stage he wanted the job back it was difficult the board refused because it was already 3 years luckily i was able to contact the chief minister at that time and represented the matter to him and he ordered the reinstatement he is retired but he is still doing well this just shows us the enormous utility of brain operations and in those days very early days 
it was very difficult to do brain operations this must have been very rewarding to you when you removed the tumor and found that you know you changed the path of the whole man's yes. life his future his work and everything indeed and as you say uh, doctor in those days brain surgery was sort of unheard of i mean when you were a young man and so on it was something unique so it would be interesting to go back to the genesis to find out whether you had this yen for you know doing medicine what it was like your childhood days how well do you remember your parents yes i think we can start uh, because after all it is your teachers and your parents so, make you what you are and also where you were born which place you were used to growing up i am always proud of saying that i was born in chiari chirgari is a very famous a uh, temple town in uh, south india in tamil nadu sung in many religious hymns and a great saint there are four saivite saints and one of them tirignana sambandhar was born in the same town my father was an assistant surgeon in the that town so surgery uh, was in your genes yeah in a way you can uh, say that but then my father himself was a very interesting personality and uh, he inherited many things from my grandfather i think i should start with my grandfather really my grandfather's name was sri kala hasti in fact he is the brother of g subramanya iyer g subramanya iyer is the founder of the hindu and the sudesha mitran in fact today is his 141st birthday of g subramanya iyer that is my grand uncle and uh, he was a great uh, social reformer he was the to the person to move the first resolution in the indian national congress in uh, bombay i think in 1892 or something and uh, my grandfather his brother was a very peculiar person he believed in truth but the difficulty was he believed in truth in all its nakedness <laughs> See, in our uh, shastras it is said satyam bruyat priyam bruyat that is you must tell the truth at the same time it must be pleasant for instance suppose a man's nose is long you don't have to go and tell him hey your nose is long <laughs> it is satyam but it is not priyam it is true but it is not pleasant but uh, he was uh, entirely a very rigid observer of the code and father he studied with his uncle because my grandfather was in kadappa district my father stayed with g subramanya iyer in triplicane and did his matriculation and then he did his mbbs he was a medalist he got a number of medals in the medical college and he used to argue with his uh, teachers so he was known as the vakil <laughs> um, most of the professors used to refer to my father as the vakil and uh, at the end of his mbbs he joined the war that was the first world war and became a captain in the ims and when the war was over he came back and continued as assistant surgeon my father had inherited some of his his father's Please. qualities he could not tolerate uh, any nonsense i don't remember very much about my mother because my mother was died when he was 5 years old I understand that she was a beautiful woman the photographs are there and a very intelligent person so who brought you up that's another big uh, lucky story because uh, soon after my mother died we were three children and my father was only 41 or something sorry three children meaning you were my elder eldest? sister myself and my younger brother my younger brother is now a retired metallurgist he did very well and became the one of the directors of the indian aluminum company in calcutta and uh, so with these three small children my grandmother persuaded uh, my father to remarry and uh, he married a lady from pudukota from a poor family but a very respected shastrik family that was our greatest luck because my chinamma we used to call her stepmother and i get uh, quite emotional when i think of her because she was such a wonderful lady and she looked after us very well protected us from our father from uh, many disciplinary actions 
and she died recently, two years ago, 84. And uh, there's not a day when we don't think of the stepmother. You see, to have a good stepmother is a very lucky, very lucky thing. And uh, I should say she was one of the factors in shaping my career. Did she have children of her own? No, unfortunately not. But she said that uh, I have already three children, so I don't want any more. She represented the essence of Hindu women. Love, affection, compassion, charity, all this. But I must go back to my grandfather, that is my mother's father, because I understand that I have inherited uh, a few things from him. He was a great Sanskrit scholar and also a mathematician. And uh, after finishing his MA, he became inspector general of schools, something like that in those days. And uh, we were very fond of him. And my uncle, that is mother's only brother, he was also a brilliant man. My interest in Sanskrit and in mathematics, I must have inherited from my maternal grandfather. So I have been lucky in the sense that from both sides of the family, there have been good traits which have been uh, inherited. And uh, naturally the genes as well as circumstances both play a part in uh, yes. shaping a person's life. We, I studied in uh, ER high school and uh, it is a small school and uh, run very well and the, we used to call the headmaster the manager in those days, he was managed the school and uh, he was also a very good mathematician, very good disciplinarian. Of course as children you know you have always do mischief and uh, I have been often called to the headmaster's office to be caned because the caning in India is on the palm not on yes. the backside as it is in the western countries. Yeah. But the strange thing is Mr. Nataraj Ayer, the headmaster, was a great friend of my father and uh, my father was a very popular medical practitioner in uh, Trichy in those days. If I am punished in school and they were strict, I can't go and tell in my house because if I go and tell uh, my grandmother or my father or my stepmother that I was uh, punished in school, then they will ask why I was punished and the punishment will be repeated <laughs> in the house. So we were uh, disciplined at the same time. Uh, all the teachers were very affectionate and uh, we always thanked them for that. What system was it? Was it the Montessori system? or the No, the regular schools of those days, no special Montessori system. And uh, regular schooling and we had the ordinary subjects like science, geography, history. You were not burdened like the children no, are no, burdened no, today? No, no, no. We had so much of time to play. So much of time to play. I remember very well, to play, to roam about, to do mischief. And then I went to St. Joseph's College, where uh, I had a wonderful two years, because that was a glorious period in that college. St. Joseph's College? Where? Uh, Trichnopoli. Trichnopoli. In the college also, I learned Sanskrit, mathematics, and uh, my idea in those days was to become an ICS officer. You see, 1937, 36, 37, the British rule was full in vogue and the collector was the king of the district. He had all the powers of everything and he was supported throughout by the government. Then later on when I come to, came to intermediate, I wanted to do mathematics and astronomy. That was my initial idea, not medicine. In those days we had BA honours in astronomy and then uh, MSc. All these were my ambitions I used to discuss with my father. I was close to him emotionally. But then he said, no ICS. ICS may be a big uh, job, but still you are a servant. You should not be the servant of anybody. In those days, one yeah, Even in those days, the, he did not like government service. Now, of course, it's terrible. We have got to go down to everybody. But not in those days. But government servant had respect and all that, but still he felt it was a servile service. Were you in awe of your father? I mean, did anything... No. You were not? No, I was in awe in the sense of discipline. But you didn't fear him? No, no, no. You no. didn't feel you had to obey him? No. Because that was the system around your time, in no. the sense, sons obeyed their fathers. We were, we were somehow, we were friendly. Friendly, we could discuss things. I used to take long walks with him in the evenings, sometimes when he was free, and uh, discuss all sorts of things, science, philosophy, So apart politics. from advice, he let you do what you wanted to yes, do? Yes, yes. But then he advised, 
He said, I would say you must take up medicine. I said, why? Because, you know, medicine is a fascinating subject. Even in those days, he thought it was fascinating. So that was his main thing. A, it will be interesting. B, you don't have to serve anybody. Was it very difficult to get into medical college? No, of course, I, there was no difficulty for me because I was first in the presidency. So it was purely on merit. So, and in those days, there was not much difficulty. There was some communal rotation. But generally, there was no problem. But one uh, very funny thing was, I was a mathematics student, but still I could get into the medical college without any difficulty. But then, they, due to communal reason, they changed and made it biology is necessary for entry into medicine. That was a very silly argument. Biology was essential for medicine only to a certain extent. But within 20 years, today for instance, Without a knowledge of mathematics and statistics, you will make a very poor uh, physician. Because now everything is, depends on various other physical forces. It is not just botany. You see, in those days, medicine was only botany. So they wanted botany there. But nowadays, where is the botany in medicine? It is all chemistry, physiology, molecular biology, genetics. But that was brought for a different reason. And luckily, now they have changed it. So mathematics also can get in. In those days, no difficulty. That is how I came into the Madras Medical College. I remember Madras Medical College in those days was a very prestigious institution all over India. Women students were given free medical education in those days. So when they joined medical college, they did not have to pay any fees. Even the fees we paid was not uh, very high, about four, five hundred rupees a year or something or even less. So education for women, because we wanted large number of women doctors, it was free. What all I am saying is during the heyday of British rule, the medical students should all wear full suit, tie, socks, boots. 1942, we remember Quit India movement. We were all terribly excited and confused as what's happening. We were told by our parents, by the political leaders who were very good then, because all the political leaders had made sacrifices, not uh, money grabbers, but who have sacrificed everything in their life. They were the leaders. They all uh, advised that uh, you are medical doctors, so country needs you, Indian doctors, so you don't uh, join. But the young blood youth was too boiling too much. So we organized a strike. We struck work in the medical college. We organized a procession. and. Uh, we got arrested. The first time we got arrested, we were released. Second time we got arrested, I was not in that batch. I was in the third row. The first row, ten fellows were put in uh, jail and were not released. And uh, we went on an indefinite strike. And I was the leader. I took over as the leader. In the meantime, there was one uh, Sonti Ramamurthy, S.V. Ramamurthy, ICS. And uh, he's uh, called the Inspector General of Police and told him, what is this foolish? You know, Inspector General of Police means Englishmen. Remember, most of them were Englishmen. He said, what uh, have you done? This is necessary for war effort. We want doctors to serve the country for war. You can't uh, arrest medical students. So he ordered the immediate release. So they were all released. And then uh, Ram Murthy himself, he advised us, said, you are wasting your time. You become doctors and then fight. Don't uh, spoil your career because it's a very important career, medical. And uh, we listened to him and then uh, after one month, I think, we rejoined the medical college. And then still there are a lot of trouble going on. Our uh, teachers, I pity them because they were nationalistic in heart, but they had to obey the government. And But they were all very good. I must mention here about Sir George McRobert. He was the professor of medicine in the Madras Medical College. So this uh, McRobert was a strict person, but very kind and affectionate to his students. And uh, during this strike, he was asked by the Surgeon General to report the names of the students who were striking. You know, we used to lie down in front of the classroom and prevent the professors from entering. And Dr. Sanjeevi, Dr. K.S. Sanjeevi, who died recently, a great man, my hero, founder of the Voluntary Health Services. He was uh, the assistant surgeon, assistant professor. So he said, Sanjeevi, please get the names. 
Then Dr. Sanjeevi told him, Sir, it is not in the line of my duty to report on my students. That is remarkable with Dr. Sanjeevi. You know what McRobert said? Sanjeevi, I deeply appreciate it. You have shown me the way. Then immediately phoned the Surgeon General, it is not in my duty to report on my students. They are my students, I look after them. After that, the government never interfered with the medical college. For how many years? Almost for three years till the war was over. See, they never interfered with us. And we learned this story afterwards. As students, we did not know that uh, this has happened. Now, after finishing the house surgency, I did my MS, my master's surgery with Dr. N.S. Narsimayar. And uh, in those days, tuberculosis was very common. Dr. Narsimayar also was the chief of the orthopedic unit. So he used to care for orthopedic uh, patients as well as general surgery patients. And uh, we have to be in the hospital at 7 a.m. In fact, the chief will come at 7 a.m. So we have got to be uh, there before 6.30, make rounds, look at the emergency cases and get the report ready as soon as the chief arrives. I got to tell him so-and-so case is doing so-and-so, so-and-so. Then we all go to the outpatient. The tuberculosis was rampant and we had a lot of patients lying down, no treatment, no streptomyces. Only bed rest, good food, milk. Two years they have to flat on their back. Imagine in the hot Madras weather with a plaster. But they were good. Patients were so patient. But our teachers taught us kindness to patients. Bedside manners which is... Kindness. Dr. Narsamayar used to say you should shed tears for your patient. So when the work is over, Six, seven, we used to sit with them in the evenings. But is it a good thing to get emotionally involved? No, that is different. Patients. You should not get emotional. But the teachers taught you to be compassionate. To be compassionate. Though he dramatized it by saying you should shed tears. Yes, yeah, I understand. But compassion is an essential part of a medical. It somehow profession. makes you, you know, get better sooner. Oh, you absolutely. That. Because the man is made up of not only the organs. But he is made up of a mind, emotion. And he needs enormous support in illness. And this fear comes in, you know. And this Anxiety and fear is really great. So which, the which I'm sorry doctor to say should yeah, understand. is lacking today in most yes. of the doctors. The right prescription yeah. slips and forget I know, about and you. they go into technology. Tell me, doctor, I'm sorry for digressing a little bit, but today is the age of super specialization. What was it like in your time? I mean, was it essential to... No, in Everyone's those days, there was no specialization. There was only general medicine, general surgery, even pediatrics, child speciality, had not become a separate uh, speciality in those days. So when you took up neurosurgery, it was something unusual? Very, very days. unusual. Now, in Narsimaya's ward, one day, he walked in and uh, said, uh, Ramurthy, I want you to apply for a scholarship. I said, yes, sir. In those days, as I told you, never say anything else. Yes, sir. Well, what is it? I said, I want you to apply. There is a Government of India scholarship. 1946, the interim government had come. And Government of India wanted to uh, get many specialists trained for the country. And neurosurgery was one of them. So he said, uh, here is the list. What would you like to do? So I saw the list and I saw thoracic surgery. So I said, sir, I'll apply for thoracic surgery. But my chief was a very clever man, very pragmatic. He said, look here, thoracic surgery, many senior people will apply. Neurosurgery, nobody will apply. So you apply and I will get it. I want you to specialize. I was scared. I, was, I didn't know what neurosurgery was. But he was a very dirga darshi. So he said, no, you are going to apply. I said, yes, sir, that's all. You don't say anything else. Don't argue. Then... Uh, he applied for the scholarship and then uh, by the time I went for the interview, I had finished my MS examination. The interview for this uh, neurosurgery took place in uh, Simla, not only for neurosurgery, for all the specialities and all the big wigs of those days were present there. Sir Lachon Samuelyar was there. There was on uh, Colonel Raja, Director General of Health Services, Colonel Lakshmanan and uh, IMS officers, Indian Medical Service, British, and uh, about nine people, I think. 
I knew that I'll have a problem because I was very young. That was in uh, 1947. I was 25 years old. Then the interview went off very well, and uh, almost for half an hour they questioned me. And then finally they said you are too young. I told them I knew that uh, this would come. I would like to mention to you that in when Johns Hopkins Hospital, one of the best universities, was founded, all the four professors. were below the age of 35 and also neurosurgery is type of a new technique so it is better to learn it when you are young than when you are old but most of them were over the age of 60 i don't think they would have been able to appreciate what a 25 year old man said so i knew i will not be selected so i thanked them and came back then i decided i'll go for frcs because frcs has been my dream from uh, my childhood either ICS or FRCS FRCS was a very covetable degree or diploma in those days a really tough and worldwide reputation you were an FRCS so i went to edinburgh and uh, i was able to finish it in two and a half months i went in end of july august end of september i got my fellowship in those days you don't have to work in britain you have to only write the examinations and pass and uh, very interesting things took place there also in my frcs examination you know in those days there was a amputation called sims amputation sim was a great surgeon of edinburgh so the edinburgh people always propagated his amputation that is you cut off the leg below the knee and give a leg artificial leg then when that question was asked you know i answered sir i don't think it is a good operation they were shocked edinburgh people in edinburgh you tell them their operation is not good I said why I told him sir in india it won't uh, work because how many of us can have artificial legs so i will operate near the ankle and keep the heel so that he can walk at least on the heel heel pad it is called and uh, he said yes that's a, a good thought and uh, the exam was over so when i came out and told uh, my colleagues that answered like this said my god you are finished you have to appear for the next exam but i passed let's see see so what i am saying is the the idea that you have got always to confirm to the examiners is wrong if you are able to politely maintain an argument then there is no difficulty at all so i finished my frcs and came back and in the meantime the madras government you know madras was a whole state at that time not uh, tamil nadu alone yes. it extended from visakhapatnam no bahampur in the north to kanyakumari in the south to mangalore in the west all was madras presidency so they wanted to send a specialist abroad so i applied and mr ab shetty was the health minister the congress government had taken over by that time and uh, i told him that uh, neurosurgery is very essential luckily i was helped by Dr K M Rai professor of radiology he was the brother in law of the minister A B Shetty so he could go and convince him that neurosurgery is necessary you should that is how i was sent by the madras government not by india government yes. for training in uh, neurosurgery then we had uh, to find a placement to where to go and uh, manchester there was one great professor there professor jefferson he was the leading british neurosurgeon and uh, i got a placement under him how old were you at the time i was uh, 1948 26 i was 26 years old when i went to second time to england to start uh, doing brain surgery that's how brain surgery started doctor before you proceed any further there's uh, something quite interesting i want to ask you in those days one married rather early so I think you have skipped your <laughs> the year when you were married. So could you tell us when you were married and how you got married? Was it an arranged marriage? Was it a love marriage? Yeah, that's a very important thing that uh, I should mention here because my wife has had considerable influence on my life and on my career over the past 50 years. You know, we have been married now 50 years. celebrated the golden jubilee golden wedding anniversary in may of this year very very pleasant function congratulations with, thank you with many many 
good friends and well wishers it was a very joyous occasion especially to realize so much of good will exist towards us that was a great thing it was in 1945 i got married i think i told you earlier that there are about 30 girls in the in my class and one of them was a sprightly short uh, thing who used to be quite attractive and also took a active part in extracurricular activities like fine arts and uh, also in the quit india movement freedom movement i was quite uh, attracted but you know we were so busy studying and uh, then i learned that she was the daughter of the lakshmi patis i should spend a few minutes here about uh, the lakshmi patis dr atsanta lakshmi pati was a great ayurvedic physician his greatness lies in the fact that he was an mbbs flourishing modern medical doctor with a excellent ophthalmology practice in fact uh, his consulting room was next to the eye hospital in egmore marshall's road now marshall's road is called rukmini lakshmi pati road named after uh, my mother in law same road he was competing he was practicing so well that he was competing with the eye hospital but in spite of this he came under the influence of pandit gopala charlu and especially after the influenza epidemic which took place in 1919 1920 all over europe and also india when nothing much could be done by modern medicine but ayurvedic drugs were found to be very useful so gradually he learned ayurveda and completely changed into an ayurvedic practitioner not only an ayurvedic practitioner but to encourage the the theories of ayurveda that is of good living ayurveda means not medicine ayurveda is a way of life way of healthy living that he wanted to propagate and he found a great ally in mahatma gandhi so he used to spend a lot of time in vardha and uh, spread the idea of village health see only now the united nations who government of india have recognized the importance of rural practice but 60 years ago dr lakshmi pati's entire propaganda throughout the country was on strengthening village practice and village health and thus he was a great man there is his own biography written and he is very well known do you accept ayurveda as yes see i was just going to say that he was a great influence on me when i was practicing neurosurgery i used to learn ayurveda from him I used to read his books listen to him and gradually got a faith in the techniques of ayurveda that is the tenets of ayurveda i am not talking only of medicine not herbal medicine but the approach to disease which is a holistic approach in ayurveda as compared to modern medicine of those days 40 years ago now modern medicine has made a somersault and has come to the idea of holistic medicine and my own field of brain surgery neurology has proved that the entire body is controlled not by organ or by organ but by a total system of chemicals circulating in the body that we have called neuropeptides we have done some research on that in the brain that again goes back to prove that this tridosha theory of a total concept of metabolism of circulation energy all these are relevant and could be usefully applied to human disease and human health so at that time of course i got slowly converted and began using ayurvedic techniques in my surgical practice now of course the whole world is changing towards ayurveda but he was a pioneer and uh, of course my parents you know a bit uh, conservative a bit not too much because my father was in the army and i told you my stepmother was most understanding she was the one who could tell my father no 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 if their family is good and the girl is good why should he object and uh, so it was arranged and uh, they agreed and we got married in 25th may 1945 i was doing my master surgery she was doing her doctor of medicine in uh, obstetrics and were you uh, classmates yeah we were classmates and uh, the greatest thing with indra was that uh, she was a great support throughout my career so i have got some weak points sometimes i am very emotional and uh, want to get things done 
immediately if it doesn't come immediately i get you know perturbed upset and uh, but she was a sort of a a ballast and uh, steadying me in the course you know like the rudder in a in a boat so very important especially when you go fast there's one thing i'd like to ask you now as the very cliched uh, statement goes behind every successful man there is a woman but in this case dr indra is also a very successful uh, person in her own field yes yes so both of you are behind each other i think yeah <laughs> wherever needed are you equally supportive we, we have to be because a girl who becomes a doctor many girls come and ask me sir should i become a doctor i said yes you should but you must remember that you have then double responsibility a male doctor doesn't have to look after the house or the children there is a wife who does it but the wife becomes a doctor then who look after the husband the children and the house you that means the doctor has the responsibility and the household response it's tremendous it is tremendous it has been a very great strain on indra of course i am absolutely useless in household work i don't know even how to <laughs> make coffee or uh, somehow they have brought me up like this my mother and my wife i don't think i can cook uh, anything at all but for me on my part the support is that i encourage her to continue in obstetrics and gynecology which is a very difficult area because it requires your service day and night and uh, sometimes she said no let me take up some other less demand uh, non clinical subject i said no your skill is very good it should be available and uh, in that way i have been extremely supportive and uh, when the children were born we had uh, the servants in our house have been also very loyal most of them have stayed with us for 30 35 40 years unless they become old and decrepit they don't leave us even then we look after them so the children were looked after by everybody and therefore it was all right it uh, it is hard for the lady the uh, women who perhaps listen to this later should realize that uh, things are not easy for the girls who become doctors but it is all right it is worth it looking back <laughs> that means you have so, no regrets marrying no, no, up no 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 lady with a career yeah yeah no no regrets but you had to maybe man has to understand and make some small sacrifices it calls so, for immense maturity and yeah. understanding support it doesn't it come easily in the early days you have to work for it yeah <laughs> it comes late 